afternoon, wherever you are, and thank you for being with us today. I must admit, I was pretty nervous when we put this session together. I never thought, you know, there would be hundreds of people who would want to listen to a bunch of geeks, but here we are today. Uh, thank you for being with us. Um, I know you are all incredibly busy, and this is a very timely session because obviously all of you are grappling with the issues that we're about to discuss today. Um, I'm Aishwarya Murthy, VP and Deputy General Counsel at TechEon, and I'll be your host today helping us navigate um, this discussion. As we all know, dealerships have had to adapt to a number of challenges in the last few years. Of course, there was the pandemic to begin with, and then there were the inventory shortages, supply chain crises. And in the meanwhile, dealerships have had to evolve themselves to adapt to changing customer expectations and the rapid move towards digitization. While dealerships have been very busy adapting to all of these changes, our regulators have been very, very busy too. Um, in the last few years, we've seen a number of regulatory developments across all fronts that impact every aspect of a dealership's operation, including the way cars are sold to how a dealership operates on a day-to-day -day basis. We've seen the new GLBA safeguards rule that takes effect in December. We've seen uh, a proposed new federal privacy regime and a new California privacy regime that comes into effect in January of 2023. And of course, last but not the least, we've seen the new FTC proposed regulations on UDAP, which cover introduces a whole new regime of both substantive as well as disclosure requirements in the car buying process. Um, in this session, what we are going to explore is how quantum leaps in technology and our ability to store and harvest data at scale are causing regulators to focus on consumer privacy, on information security, and advertising issues as well. Um, and then we're going to focus on what best practices you as dealers can adopt uh, to stay compliant in this ever-changing regulatory landscape. We have an all-star panel here today to talk us through all of these issues. So we're going to spend the first hour of this session um, in a discussion with our panelists, who I will introduce in just a second. And then we will be doing live Q&A. So please hang on to those questions and we'll get right to them at the end. Um, since many of our panelists are in very sensitive and confidential discussions with regulators for most of their lives, uh, we would like to request your cooperation on a couple of ground rules. Firstly, this is an educational session, so we will be conveying factual information, uh, but we will not be taking positions on issues, so we will try to stay neutral as far as possible. Um, number two, we will not be providing legal advice in this session. We'll be discussing macro trends and themes in general, but uh, we will not be providing specific legal guidance. You are very, very welcome to reach out to one of the panelists individually to um, obtain advice on any issue that you would like. And finally, we will not be conveying any confidential information in this session. Um, this includes discussions with regulators on current issues or any unpublished knowledge of upcoming legislative or regulatory changes um, that we are aware of. Without further ado, let's get right into our panelists. So first off, we have Mike Alford, who I'm sure all of you know, since he is a celebrity. Mike is the president of Marine Chevrolet in Jacksonville, North Carolina. He is also the current NADA chairman and a recipient of the Time Dealer of the Year Award. Um, Mike has in, been in the automotive industry for over 30 years now, and in addition to running one of the most successful dealerships in the country, is now focused on solving policy issues for dealers. We then have Paul Mitri. Paul is the SVP of Regulatory Affairs at NADA. Paul spends his life directing a team of attorneys who represent dealer interests before federal regulatory authorities and educating dealers on how best they can comply. I cannot think of a more qualified person than Paul to talk about the issues we're going to be discussing today. Next up, we have Aaron Jacoby. Aaron is the managing partner and head of the automotive practice at Aaron Fox Schiff LLP, um, one of our premier law firms in the country. Aaron is one of the most forward thinking and disruptive attorneys you will ever meet in the automotive space. And I am frequently 
surprised by how progressive he can be on a lot of the issues. Aaron spends his time counseling dealerships on navigating federal and state regulatory regimes, class action, litigation, and transactions as well. Uh, fun fact, Aaron's firm was also one of the first to open up an office in the metaverse, um, which is a testament, of course, to his firm's forward-thinking approach. Um, moving on to some of my favorite techionites, we have Ved Sirtani, who is our VP of Engineering and is the wizard behind the Techion cloud applications that many of you use today. Um, Ved's expertise lies in building scalable solutions that enable companies to grow very, very quickly, enable agility, and deliver best-in-class technology solutions. In addition to our core architecture and applications, VED is responsible for information security, machine learning, our big data platform, as well as our cloud infrastructure, all of which we will be discussing today. And finally, Deepak Singh. Deepak is our Assistant General Counsel and Data Privacy Officer at Techion. He is responsible for our privacy by design initiatives, as well as counseling our teams on how to build industry leading secure and compliant products. Prior to joining Techion, Deepak was at Kraft Heinz in Netherlands, where he led a team that focused on GDPR and enabling privacy at Kraft Heinz, and that experience crucially in, informs his perspective at Techie on, on how we embrace information security, privacy, product compliance, and the challenges that that brings. So let's jump right into it. We'll begin with Mike. Mike, you've been in automotive retailing for over 30 years now. What are the changes you've seen in your time, and how are consumer expectations changing, and what do dealerships need to do? You know, gosh, change is a constant in our space. It always has been. I think the best re retailers sort of embrace that and adapt to whatever the, the stimulus is in the marketplace. For us, you know, just technology, you know, the advent of the internet years ago, um, you know, speed, search, uh, the advent of digital retailing, and then the COVID acceleration, if you will, in terms of the utilization of these tools by by all, uh, the shortage of product, um, so that the you know the consumer is doing a search at, at a greater geographical area and and are, is much more willing to conduct business um, further away from from where they are because of necessity. Um, you know the need for personalization, unique customer experience, really targeted, hyper targeted advertising and marketing. Um, a desire for transparency, speed, an Apple-like experience, if you will. Um, but you know, I think it's a, it's an omni-channel approach. Working with our, our OEMs uh, to meet the customer where they are in the buying process. If it's twenty percent digital and eighty percent what I would call traditional, or vice versa, we want to be able to to have a great customer experience. Um, and and again, these these technologies are, are advancing to the point where it's adding great value to the transparency of the process, the speed of the process, um, and the outcome for the consumer. You know, the, the, the part we'll get into going forward is, is some of the regulatory dynamic that may be upon us that may change some of that, right? You know, in terms of um, more disclosure, more record keeping, um, um, more interruptions in the process, if you will, all that has to be worked out. But, you know, I, I would say that uh, these are unique times and uh, and competition is, is only going to heat up, um, you know, as we go forward. And those that embrace these tools and, and, and uh, are good at using them will, will thrive in the marketplace. Thank you, Mike. That was very interesting. So in, in your view, technology plays a crucial role in how dealerships adapt to changing customer expectations. Um, you also touched on 
personalization, hyper-targeted marketing, um, and, and sort of, uh, I want to bring in our technologist, Ved, here, to talk about the role technology plays in driving this revolution in automotive retail. Um, Ved, we keep hearing about personalization and how it is the future of not only automotive, but retail in general. Tell us about the power of technology and big data and how dealerships can leverage this to compete effectively in today's market and maybe take a more macro view, starting with how retailing in general has changed and then maybe distill that down to um, automotive. Sure. Um, you rightly mentioned that you know today's customers are seeking more and more personalized experiences. Their expectations have only grown. Um, the pandemic only contributed uh, to more innovation and it actually has driven more rapid change in the customer behavior. And to meet these uh, ever-changing and increasing customer expectations, uh, the adoption of uh, modern technologies is very, very critical. And uh, cloud has been the, the real change in technology over the past decade. And that has been driving the major changes across uh, you know, many, many, many industries, including retail and automotive now. Um, it brings in so many advantages over traditional systems that it puts businesses over, you know, gives them a significant advantage over, you know, when they're using traditional systems versus the modern day technologies. It, it just makes them so agile now. Um, traditionally, you know, to get the upgrades, you know, it used to be very painful and very slow. Um, if there's a new regulation or there's a new advanced feature that you need to bring um, efficiency to your business, to get those changes, you have to wait a lot, lot of uh, time uh, in the older traditional systems. Cloud changed that. And uh, you know, adoption of uh, cloud technologies helps you get those features faster and adopt uh, new innovations, which are sometimes so cloud exclusive that they are not even available in traditional systems. Um, additionally, you know, it, it, the cloud is making systems more cost efficient. Um, it allows the service providers to, you know, um, select how much compute they need, scale them up, scale them down in real time. And this allows solution providers to give those advanced features and new insights and big data solutions at a fraction of cost, which sometimes may not even be possible in traditional systems. Um, and it doesn't even bind you to uh, those features. Um, the flexibility allows you to have pay-as-you-go models and allowing you to freely experiment and tweak your business process with new innovations on a continuous basis. Then, then comes the security, of course. You know, um, Traditionally, there has been a debate on cloud-based systems, whether they are more secure or not. If data can be shared from anywhere, does it make it more secure. But increasingly we have uh, found that uh, a number of data theft has an internal employee involved or a social engineer done on an employee. Um, with cloud solutions, you don't have to share data over drives or maintain multiple physical copies, thereby of course reducing the attack surface. And then you have fine grain control over how you share the data and the auditability and traceability of who has access data and where they have access to data from gives you far more uh, 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 um, kind of uh, you know ability to you know monitor your solutions and monitor any anomalies that you find. These cloud providers actually can help you um, you know monitor it twenty four seven on a continuous basis. And the biggest advantage that you know the modern day technologies are bringing is allowing you to give. Uh, your customers' personalized experiences using big data and AI. If you look at the big giants like Amazon and Walmart and Apple, uh, big data and AI is at the heart of everything they do today. Uh, most of their massive success is attributed to how they have utilized their data. And these companies have now greater understanding of their customers' shopping habits, and they know how to price products. Every search today that you do on these um, websites is guided by AI. It, every time you search something, it suggests you know, what a customer would be looking for next. And it guides them into building those solutions. 
And the same thing is happening in automotive as well. Uh, it's been quite some time that we are seeing these revolutions building. Um, these solutions can help dealers know what the customers are looking for. It can help you drive more effective sales campaigns by, by, by personalizing every single communication. And it can guide you, you know, when to reach out to customers, give them the right talking points um, to give you the most optimum results. It can help in detaining customers as well as driving more loyalty. There are far more benefits that we can talk about. But the key thing is that adoption of uh, modern technologies like cloud and big data can give businesses significant competitive advantages over those who are still using traditional systems. Thank you, Ved. Um, really interesting points. And obviously that means we're trying to put control in the hands of the consumers, but in order to do so, that means that um, dealerships and you know technologies that they use have a lot of data about customers. Um, the changes in customer preferences and the way that automotive retailing is done, including the advent of powerful technology and the possibilities that that generates is something that certainly has caused increasing regulatory focus in this space. Um, Aaron and Paul, maybe let's bring you in here. Obviously, in the last few years, we've seen a huge expansion of regulatory reach and scope, specifically in the automotive space. We're seeing a lot of new regulations come through, a lot of proposed <laughs> regulations come through as well. Tell us what's keeping our regulators up at night and how do you see the regulatory landscape evolving? Oh, great. Uh, perhaps I can start out. I would just say um, thank you for having us. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, the, the regulators at the moment are very, very active. Uh, there's all kinds of issues that they're tracking, certainly within the privacy arena. As you teed up the very beginning, they are very focused on the amended safeguards rule. That is a real departure from what has been in place, actually, since the rule came out in 2003. It is, uh, as it relates to what dealers have to do as financial institutions, just an incredibly involved uh, series of steps they have to take between now and December. So certainly a lot of focus there uh, from the regulator's perspective. They're looking at many other areas in privacy. And, and one theme that perhaps everyone should be focused on is just what they consider to be uh, data that you have to protect. I, I think a lot of times uh, dealers recognizing that they kind of have a dual role. Certainly they're financial institutions, they get information through their credit and lease contracts, but then you also have other personal information they get that's unrelated to their finance activities. And I think traditionally many people have thought of the latter as kind of being off limits as far as the safeguards rule is concerned. But the FTC has made clear over and over that really all sensitive information has to be protected. If it does not come within the safeguards rule ambit, it comes within their section five authority under the FTC Act to protect against unfair and deceptive acts or practices. And they've taken a number of enforcement actions recently in that area. And actually they've done it for some time, uh, even going back to uh, cases from the 2006 timeframe, BJ's Wholesale Club and, and that type of thing, where they've really emphasized over time that you really have to protect information across the board. So privacy is a huge area of focus that includes safeguarding. And then as far as dealer operations are concerned, they're very focused on advertising. They're very focused on voluntary protection products. They're very focused on fair credit. Uh, there, there's a number of areas they've really looked at. It's, it's a very active period. It certainly did not start recently, but it's really accelerated recently. And on a go forward basis, both from an advocacy standpoint as far as NADA is concerned, but also a compliance standpoint as far as NADA members are concerned, there definitely is a lot to occupy everyone's time. And what do you think all is driving these changes? Well, certainly uh, th there's, there's definitely changes in the marketplace that will cause focus. I mean, again, I think you hit on a number of things. When you talk about machine learning, dark patterns, artificial intelligence, privacy concerns that stem from them, that's probably not a discussion we're having a couple of decades ago. So definitely changes in technology will bring that about. Certainly, uh, we've even seen regulation over the last uh, 10 or 20 years. You know, when you think about uh, laws like the Can Spam Act or in 2003, the National Do Not Call List, these were really efforts to try to keep pace with what was going on. 
Although I think it goes beyond that. Right now, the group at the Federal Trade Commission is very proactive. They've stated they think a number of things that need to be changed, and they're trying to push forward on those fronts. So I, I think some of it is the climate we find ourselves in just because technology is progressing, but it also is the current leadership, at the, particularly the Federal Trade Commission, which of course, for consumer protection purposes, is the lead federal regulator for auto dealers. So we're, we're seeing different factors at play. And are you seeing an expansion in the um, federal regulatory scope uh, or appetite rather for that expansion, um, because as we know, dealerships are regulated at both state and federal re levels. So far, I think it's been mostly state regulation with you know some important things like the TILA, et cetera, being regulated at the federal level. But we're now seeing more and more FTC activity on things that are already legislated for, um, you know, in state regulatory frameworks. What do you think is driving that appetite? Where do you see that going? And, and, and do you see some sort of harmonization along the way? Well, I think it's a great observation. And I definitely think that that is at play. I mean, if you think about the Federal Trade Commission over the past couple of decades, they have come out with a lot of rules, but what have they been? Uh, most of them have been statutorily directed. If we think about even the ones we're talking about here, the safeguards rule and the privacy rule, those are a product of the gram leach bliley Act. They were directed by Congress to act. The FACT Act of 2003 that amended the Fair Credit Reporting Act, that also directed a number of new rules, risk-based pricing rule, the red flags rule, the disposal rule, there were a number of them where they had to act because Congress directed them to do so. They also do periodic regulatory reviews that actually prompted a change to the used car rule several years ago. And then they do some standard things like having to renew Paperwork Reduction Act clearances and, and that type of thing. What is new now, though, to your point, is we do see this unfair deceptive act or practice rule. This is completely discretionary. It was not directed by Congress. And as you said, the states are very heavily involved in these areas. They have all kinds of regimes that relate to advertising, that relate to disclosures. Uh, and also at the federal level, you have quite a bit of law on that now as well. So it's a very proactive group. Uh, they said they want to make some real changes in the auto industry. I think we're seeing that in the rule that they proposed. And that definitely represents a change from the past. Uh, enforcement actions have been present. They've, they've done those over the years. Uh, that has been fairly steady. Certainly in the last 10 years, we've seen about three dozen of them, mainly in the advertising area, but not limited to advertising. But now we're seeing the use of what they believe is discretionary authority to try to address different practices. And as you said, what is interesting is, unlike some of the other things we talked about that were truly filling a void in the sense that the Can Spam Act was trying to regulate what was going on with emails and Do Not Call was trying to regulate something that the Telephone Consumer Protection Act of 1991, they felt had not caught up with. This is something where they're wading into areas where you do have federal and state standards in place. So that is definitely a new dynamic. Absolutely. Let's bring Aaron in here because Aaron, I know you represent a number of dealerships and you're constantly in discussion with regulators. What's your perspective on what's driving these changes? Where do you see it going and how do you see it impacting dealerships in, in terms of how they operate and enforcement actions? Well, uh, th first of all, thank you for having me on the on the panel and I'll echo a lot of what uh, Paul said, but going back to really what Mike said at the beginning, there's, there's a lot of technology at play here that uh, already existed, but was accelerated during the pandemic. And I think uh, while none of us liked the, you know, the pandemic or all the things we had to do during the pandemic, what, there are some benefits that are being drawn from it. And that is the same technology that we were able to use that, that created some of the abilities that, that Mike talked about. Uh, hyper-focused advertising, digital sales, uh, enabling consumers to shop more broadly and, and widely because of the technology that, that's available. These things are here to stay and everybody learned how to do it, dealers and consumers, uh, and it made it much easier to transact business. Um, and so those benefits are, are going to be kept. Now, what are the concerns? The concerns are things that as Paul was just 
ticking off the history, whether it was TCPA or safeguards rule or red flags rule, that things that happened over the years were the legislature's desire to uh, connect with what consumers wanted, which they want the access that technology gives them. They want the shopping capability and they want to give their information, but they want to maintain privacy and security with the entity they're transacting business with. Uh, and they don't want their information used or sold in any other way. So that's what all of, all of these various laws are reacting to is consumer desire. Uh, and so we have to understand also that while the laws are, are imperfect, especially at the outset, and Paul and NADA do a fantastic job of trying to mitigate the, the more um, outlier elements of, of these laws and try to bring them into line with uh, what is realistic and conforms to, to more practical uh, needs and hopefully they'll do that with um, you know the FTC uh, rulemaking uh, with the rules that will ultimately come out in December. Um, but uh, the idea is that dealers need to enact uh, in their own dealerships compliance standards that go along with whatever the rules are. And as Mike also said earlier, dealers are very quick to adapt. They're very good at adapting and they will adapt to whatever these rules require. That doesn't mean we want unrealistic rules that impose unreasonable burdens. Um, but once NEDA is done with what it can do to mitigate some of the more, uh, I suppose on our side of the coin, we would consider it crazy making <laughs> um, uh, that some of the rules uh, create. Um, once the rules are in place, we will be able to design compliance standards for dealers to um, uh, enact in their in their dealerships, and they'll be able to make it work. Thank you, Aaron. I, I want to bring in Deepak here. I, I think um, where we've been so far is, you know, and, and we still are to some extent today, is you do have salespeople who take pictures of driver's licenses on their phones, and you have this kind of treasure trove of in, like very, very valuable personal information that is sitting outside of you know, the uh, company provided equipment, right, or dealership provided equipment. Obviously, you know, we, we've seen the Uber data breach recently. We've seen a number of very, very sophisticated organizations breached recently. I mean, you know, in the last month, at least I can think of, you know, at least three organizations that were breached and it's all over the news today. Um, when we think about practices like that, where a salesperson just sort of takes a picture of somebody's driver's licenses as it's sitting in their phone, the potential for misuse of that information is just immense, right? And obviously dealerships are sort of sitting right in the middle of that. Um, Deepak, I wanna bring you in here because obviously you've dealt with data management and, and privacy across the world, including in Europe, which has one of the most sophisticated privacy regimes. Um, tell us about the data protection and privacy trends that you're seeing globally, um, where you expect this to go, and also touch on the new federal privacy law that we are seeing in the U.S., which, unlike the FTC rule, is actually something that we've been waiting for because it is impossible to comply with 50 different versions of privacy rules um, in the United States. Yeah, great question, and, and thanks, Ashwarya. Um, you know, I think to understand a bit where these privacy laws are going, um, we sort of need to touch a little bit on how we got here. So I think, as you and Bay then mentioned, you know, data analytics is really at the heart of what most new marketing and business technologies are are really trying to do. Um, you know, it helps companies like dealers and OEMs really understand what their customers are looking for and how to best reach them. Um, but I think a bit, you know, I think the industry got off a bit on the wrong foot. You know, for most businesses, uh, dealerships included, you know, data quality is really much more important than the quantity. But for other companies like Meta, Experian, and you've got data aggregators, you know, more data really equals more profit for their business. And so for them, it, it's a bit more of this data is the new oil concept. And they've really pushed to kind of collect as much data as they can about their customers um, and their preferences. Um, and as I think uh, uh, Aaron just re uh, referenced, you know, these 
broad data collection practices have really made consumers more and more uncomfortable with sharing their data with businesses in general. And so you take that and combine it with the fact that securing data is, is really different than securing a, a physical asset. You know, unlike a physical asset, you know, data can be shared instantly with anyone and it's, it can be infinitely replicated. So once you lose it, you know, the impact on that individual is, is really lasting. Uh, you know, for example, last year, uh, T-Mobile actually suffered a, a major data breach involving, I think it was 76 million current and former users. Um, and the information that they lost included social security numbers and driver's license numbers, uh, both of which are, you know, you can be used to commit fraud and also very difficult for individuals to change. Um, you also have hackers who are becoming more and more sophisticated and increasingly are supported by government states like China and Russia. And so for that reason, I think data collection and data security is going to remain a top priority for regulators worldwide. Um, and to that end, um, I think as you referenced, the, the GDPR in Europe, which went into effect now about four years ago, has really set the tone for what privacy laws in the US and worldwide are likely going to look like. Um, so unlike GLBA and other federal privacy laws in the US, which really only apply to data collected under certain circumstances and by certain companies, uh, for example, in connection with financing, you know, the GDPR really broadly applies to any personal data that is collected by a business. Um, and in fact, you know, business can't collect, use, or transfer personal data unless it is permitted by GDPR, which I think is really different than what most US laws currently require, and they, which typically you know, focus on giving individuals the right to opt out of how their data is used. Um, along those lines, you know, GDPR also really requires companies to minimize how much their personal data they're collecting and holding and uh, provide a lot more transparency into what they're collecting and how they're sharing it with third parties. Um, and finally, it really gives individuals many rights with their data. So for example, the right to access their data or to delete it. Um, and as I think the panelists have alluded to, these, these principles have really influenced several state privacy laws like CCPA, CPRA going into effect in January, as well as other state laws like Virginia's Consumer Privacy uh, Data Protection Act. Um, and it's also the inspiration, as you mentioned, behind the proposed federal privacy law, uh, which is ADPPA. And that aims to really create this comprehensive federal data privacy law to replace this current mishmash and patchwork of state and federal laws. So to answer your question, you know, where are we likely to have, end up in terms of privacy laws in the next year or two? You know, it's, it's tough to say, but I think there's a few likely scenarios. Um, so first, I think we're going to finally see some kind of comprehensive federal privacy law in the next two years to really replace these state laws like CPRA. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, this is a good thing for dealers because you know, the alternative is a patchwork of really inconsistent state privacy laws and with more and more states passing their own privacy laws in the near future. Um, you know, privacy regulation isn't just gonna go away just because we don't have a federal law. Uh, it's much better to have a central law like GDPR that dealers and businesses can really refer to and focus on. Um, second, I think data transparency is gonna really remain a focus for regulators and plaintiff's attorneys. You know, the less transparent a business is with how it uses data, the more likely it is going to run into issues with its customers, both in terms of the customer's trust as well as legal compliance. Um, you know, just for a few weeks ago, actually, the California Attorney General settled its first CCPA action against Sephora um, for failing to actually disclose to users that it was selling user data and collecting that information for targeted advertising. Um, I think it was something like a $1.2 million fine that they settled for. And I would expect you know, similar enforcement actions in the future. Um, and then third, as we've kind of all uh, discussed uh, throughout this panel, data security is going to be a priority, you know? And this one seems obvious, but I really think strong data security not only minimizes the risk of a data breach, um, it really creates a defense against the lawsuits and investigations that ultimately follow that breach. So companies that really implement in industry best security practices or who work with vendors that follow industry best practices, uh, I think they're, they're really preparing themselves for the future, you know, no matter what the legal landscape looks like in the next two to five years. Um, you know, there's obviously many other themes that we're going to see, uh, particularly as the technology continues evolving and regulators really struggle to draft laws to keep up. 
But I think it's pretty fair to say that these are probably three trends that are really here to stay for the immediate future. And, and do you think, Deepak, that, I mean, of course, this is not specific to automotive, but do you think the, the recent incidents that we've been seeing and, you know, the increasing potential for sensitive data to be found in the dark web, et cetera, has a, um, resulted in organizations being more willing to embrace technology and number two, being more mindful about what they collect and how they store it, right? Because we've, you know, a few years ago, I think, you know, companies would kind of get their hands on any information that they could without fully understanding that, you know, there was a responsibility that went with that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think they touched on this, but um, you know, there's an argument to be made that the cloud is really is a good thing in that sense because it really allows companies to uh, kind of off centralize their data storage in a, in a place that's not on their own systems, right? So you can really kind of focus your security in one place, but it's not on your own uh, your own platform or in your own uh, your own system there. Um, so I think that that is that is certainly true um, in terms of the type of information that. Uh, people are willing to hand over and that they can, customers are, or businesses, I guess, are trying to collect. Um, I definitely do think uh, quality over quantity, right? So for example, if you're going in to purchase a, or a, 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 a new MacBook, you don't need to hand over your social security number. Um, and I think businesses also are realizing by minimizing the amount of data that they're collecting, they're really future-proofing themselves against that inevitable data breach and the less information to have on hand, really the better for them. So I, I absolutely think that's that's correct on both sides. Sounds great. Sorry, Aaron, I know you have a point. I just wanted to add to what uh, Deepak just said about uh, dealers moving their data to, you know, a, a centralized third-party source. It really moved, it, it's a specialized area, both holding and securing and maintaining and using the data is a very specialized area. And unless a dealership group is extremely large, and even in that case, it's still just not what they do, not what they have expertise in. And it, it, it really uh, gives them a shield against liability and government enforcement in the future to move that uh, whole process off to a third party like Techion uh, uh, but I suppose it doesn't have to be <laughs> tech. Yeah, on. exactly. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a specialized thing that there is really no way for dealers to compete with, uh, you know, high tech companies, hackers, Russia, China, North Korea. It's not, it's not possible for dealers to do that. Absolutely, Aaron. That was a point actually I was going to make, which is, I mean, if you think about Shopify as an example, right? What did Shopify do? It offered a platform that enabled small businesses to set up online stores while they took care of all of the things like security and you know verification yes. and et cetera on their end. Same thing with Stripe as well. Why is Stripe valued the way that it is valued, right? Because they are making it simple for business, small and medium businesses, or even large businesses to accept online payments without having to go through all of the licensing and the regulatory frameworks that, you know, you would normally have to, have to go through in order to be able to offer payments, right? Um, and so I think you're seeing an increasing move towards platformization where you are able to offer um, a platform that allows each individual customer to offer unique experiences without having to worry about the regulatory and compliance aspects of it because those are already kind of built in. And that is something that customers are starting to expect to see. This is a great time to bring in Mike um, to talk about what it feels like to be a dealer today. Um, you know, dealers come in all shapes and sizes. Um, some are very small operations and some are large listed companies. Um, but despite being sort of small operators, they are subject to this regulatory uh, regime that typically only applies to very, very sophisticated uh, players purely because of the nature of the information that they have. Tell us about what it feels like to be a dealer today and what are the investments that you think dealers need to make in order to thrive in this environment and stay competitive? 
You know, I think dealers who have been successful over a long period of time have always wanted to know uh, nuances about their customers. They want they want uh, repeat and referral business and then conquest, and they want to use information to surprise and delight their current customers as well as um, meet the expectations of a prospect, if you will. And then with technology and data and the tools used to, you know, uh, create a, a digital experience that is targeted, that gives you an opportunity to connect with that consumer digitally or how I have, and then, and then safeguarding that data, if you will, that, that new responsibility to ensure that, you know, we're able to meet the speed and transparency and the utilization of good information in a way that has a great outcome. Uh, and make certain that we also abide by the law and we protect, you know, we're entrusted with that information. So we, we don't want to be um, the target of some sort of data attack that um, subjects us to embarrassment and, and penalties and, and, and hurts our customer base. So, you know, there, now with the safeguard dynamic and, and, and that, that deadline looming, we're all learning so much more about the hardware that we have, the protection that we have, the opportunity to use the cloud, the opportunity to outsource to others, um, compliance programs, you know, what, what, what those options are. I think we're all drinking, um, you know, to about a fire, uh, fire hose of, of, and, and, and there's, there's a great sense of urgency to get this done clearly by the mandated deadline of December 9th, I believe it is. So um, it's uh, it's a fascinating time. Um, and it's one in which, you know, Paul and the folks at NADA have been so great at helping dealers to understand. And, and then, you know, companies like Techion um, who are leading, leading the way to help us a um, not only survive, but thrive against the direct sellers of the world, the, the used car players, if you will, um, but also um, to, to make certain that we do it properly and, uh, and that uh, we abide by the law, if you will. Thank you, Mike. Um, just a note for all attendees, we are accepting questions via the Q&A button that you see at the bottom of your screen. So please type in those questions over there. And then, um, you know, we'll, we can't promise we'll answer all of them, but we'll choose a few. And hopefully we have time to, to get through all of them. Um, Paul and Aaron, I want to bring you in here to talk about the kind of infrastructure, compliance and regulatory infrastructure that the new regulations call for dealers to have. Um, obviously, dealers are not equipped or haven't been equipped recent until recently um, to meet this uh, increasing burden on them. Um, maybe let's use the upcoming safeguards role and the proposed FTC roles as examples to illustrate really what kind of compliance infrastructure uh, dealers need to put in place in order to stay compliant. Sure, well, happy to start out. And I think you teed it up nicely. I mean, the, the, the problem is particularly with the Federal Trade Commission, they oversee so many different types of entities that when they have a requirement, the real question becomes, can you tailor it to your individual circumstances? And that really can be a challenge. I mean, they oversee debt collectors and tax preparers and, and of course dealers and that kind of thing. So there are a lot of different entities and trying to take something of general application and really pull it into your operation so it fits neatly, it becomes incredibly important. I, I think that for dealers, as Mike said, they have been drinking out of a fire hose. If you look at just the sheer number of new regulations at the federal level alone, it has been enormous. It, of course, has picked up pace over the years, and that's before you get into the state and local overlay. So that becomes very difficult. In terms of you know tools and the way to do it, obviously there are great vendors out there. There's a lot of great support. There's great attorneys, great firms out there that are helping dealers glue things together. What we typically try to do is, you know, we, for our members, we advocate and we educate. And so, of course, there was a period of advocacy that related to the safeguards rule. Once they finalized it, we shifted gears and we started to educate. And one thing we try to do to kind of give them a basic framework is just provide for them a template in the form of a written program. So we have a guide that 
we updated. We've always had a safeguards guide out, but we updated when the new rules came out. And one thing it has is a template to help dealers get their necessary written program in place. However, we always have to caution dealers that with 17,000 members in all 50 states, and the fact that it needs to be reflective of their individual circumstances, they cannot just simply put a stamp on it and, and feel as though they've done what they have to do. They certainly have to make sure it's adjusted to their circumstances. And equally important, it's not enough simply to adopt a program. You have to implement it and you have to maintain it. And the FTC has said that over the years, uh, certainly since I've been at NADA, they have made this point repeatedly. They look to try to make sure that people are maintaining programs that are active and reflective of current threats. And of course, the safeguards rule puts that obligation on financial institutions. They tell dealers, they tell their financial institutions, when you do a risk assessment, you've got to look at current threats, obviously of whatever nature, internal, external, it could be from vendors, it could be from employees, it could be from hackers, whatever the source is, but you've got to identify current threats and you have to have current safeguards for them and you have to adjust your program as necessary. So again, with a broad membership, with a very fluid situation, the fact that it has to be individualized, that is certainly a challenge. And that's why it's really helpful to have all the different resources in the industry to help dealers get to the point where they have to be. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that uh, Paul just said. You know, it's it's interesting that all of this really, again, points to outsourcing. It, it's one thing to, you know, assuming that some of the major points uh, that the FTC has put forward will actually be enacted. It's easy enough for a dealership to designate a qualified person at the dealership to monitor all of these things. It's easy enough for them to design with help from their lawyer uh, uh, a safeguards policy, um, and it's it's easy enough. Nothing is easy, but it, it it's easy enough to have a, a way to train staff, etc. Um, but beyond that, some of the things like testing your privacy protection system annually, um, evaluating it. You know, what does that even mean, and how will that be judged later by a third party or enforcement agency? Those are things that, that dealers are probably, um, for the most part, not going to be equipped to do. Uh, but to the extent they're outsourcing the, those more specialized needs with regard to complying with um, whatever the rules will, will be, uh, which most likely will include those two points about testing your system, evaluating your system, um, that that can be handled through outsourcing. And I, and I think that, uh, you know, you're ahead of the curve at your company um, in, in helping people do that. And uh, dealers must be thinking about that at this point in time. Mike, I want to bring you in for a second. Um, in the last few months, we've seen a lot of dealerships begin to look for compliance officers and security officers. Are you seeing that as a trend in response to the new regulations? And, and where do you see that? I mean, do you see dealerships now starting to need sort of a, a professional staff of you know security or compliance officers to help them stay afloat? Um, I think uh, I think we all uh, are leaning hard on on good good counsel and um, and we are outsourcing to different firms that are out there that have really focused uh, in specifically on the safeguards. Um, you know, the training, the proper training of all employees to make certain that um, there, there's there's a good process in place and that there's an ongoing process to ensure that we remain compliant. Um, the combination of uh, delegating that responsibility to a full-time equivalent employee supported by uh, outsourced um, good good uh, firms that are out there. Um, I, I think it's a combination, if you will. And I think it depends on the scale of the organization. Absolutely, because I, I, I would find it I mean, if I were a small dealer, you know, maybe maybe with a couple of stores, it I would find it daunting to sort of go and hire a compliance officer or a security officer just for my operation. So definitely the outsourcing and relying on a technology provider that kind of stays up to date 
with um, you know the changing regulations is probably the path I would choose. Um, probably a good time to get into best practices, Ved. Um, uh, wear your technologist hat and tell us about best practices on information security and how sort of being in the cloud may be an inherent advantage for dealers as they navigate these new requirements. I mean, when it comes to best practices, I mean, the technology is your best friend here. Um, cloud solutions today uh, provide already the most of the necessary tools required to stay compliant. Um, advanced platforms like Techion go one level further and allow you to customize those security features in ways that can help you stay compliant as well as, you know, avoid the friction uh, to the ways your users might be, you know, used to using the system. Um, an example like MFA, it's become a standard feature in most of the new age softwares. Uh, modern applications are allowing you to access information from anywhere through your tablets and your smartphones and allows you to easily data share, which means uh, you don't need to copy data onto physical devices. I think we touched upon a few points like this, which could, you know, the dealers can use these advanced security features to finally control who gets to access the data and they can trace back when it was shared with whom and where we are with that, uh, if anyone downloaded the data and where they access it from limiting uh, very finely on individual fields even that, uh, you know, even if you are sharing the data, you can hide certain portions of it and very, very finely control it. And advanced software will guide you into, you know, automatically templatizing these kind of things so that, you know, you don't have to, you know, get into nitty gritties of each and every small thing. Um, if you talk about, you know, data storage and maintaining its privacy. All data is always encrypted in storage and even while in transit, it's always encrypted. That's almost like a standard solution in the modern technologies. Um, what I'm trying to say is that most of these best practices are already baked into modern applications. And once you adopt these technologies, it's the easiest way to stay compliant. Um, in addition to this, uh, cloud applications today, the providers themselves, they have to implement very strict controls to maintain um, your applications and data secure. At Techion, for example, uh, every change uh, that goes into the system, whenever we make a new feature or push any changes, it goes through multiple layers of security testing on a continuous basis. Um, it can slow down innovation given the time it takes, but um, the adoption of new technologies has allowed us to uh, make it easy and you know continue to innovate faster at the same time, staying absolutely secure. Sounds good, Ved. And and just one one additional question for you. Let's say you were the CTO of a dealership. What are the questions you would be asking of your technology provider? Or maybe at, what, what are the parameters based on which you would choose a technology provider? Let's put it that way. I mean, it's it's difficult to say because, you know, it depends on how mature you are in terms of your own security posture and how much do you understand um, some of these laws as well as the best practices. Um, I would say, you know, the first thing you want to start by, you know, checking what kind of compliances your solution providers have. What are they using? Are they on the cloud? Are they on the cloud that is one of the known clouds who, who has implemented those security controls? And then, you know, if it makes sense, you can get into, you know, more details in, uh, around how their data is managed and how, the secure, how they're securing that data. It's probably a good time to bring in Deepak. Um, tell us about best practices on data management and privacy that if you were the chief compliance officer at a dealership, you would put in place and, and maybe ask of your technology vendors as well. Yeah, so I, I think we've kind of touched on this before, but transparency. Um, you know, for me, that's kind of the best first practice and a relatively easy place to start is really with their privacy notice. Um, you know, dust it off, read it. Uh, does it reflect how you are collecting, using, and sharing data with third parties? And if it doesn't, make sure it does. Um, look at the different areas in your business where you are collecting data and identify what data, personal data you are collecting, why you're collecting, and how it's used. Um, and if you're relying on vendors uh, to do that collection for you, 
you know, read their privacy notices, talk to them about how they're collecting data so you can incorporate their practices into your notice. And then just make it a regular practice to review and update your notice at least once a year. Um, along those lines, I also would make your notice easy to understand. Um, I think a common misconception about legal documents, especially with privacy notices, is that they have to be complicated. And they really don't. Uh, the easier your privacy notice is for a consumer to understand, the less likely they are to complain to a regulator or to bring a lawsuit against you. Um, and while most people skip tend to skip over the privacy notice, um, much to my, my dismay, uh, it is worth noting that a privacy notice really does serve two important purposes for dealers. Uh, the first one is that it's a compliance requirement, right? So several, several laws like GLBA and CCPA require it. But second, it also gives dealers a defense against the lack of transparency claims um, because you've, you've told your cons cons customers and consumers how you're collecting and using their data. Um, as an example, for, for Techion customers, you know, we give them the ability to place their privacy notice throughout our platform at the different points where they are collecting their customers' data. Um, along those lines and kind of touching on what uh, Aaron had, had mentioned in terms of vetting and, and confirming what your vendors are doing, you know, we are launching something called, we're calling the Techion Trust Portal, which is really going to give detailed insight to our customers about how we handle their data and what we're doing to secure it. Um, and in fact, along those lines, we've kind of already posted our data processing agreement online, which really lists our commitments to our customers on how we're going to secure them, their and their customers' data. Um, so I think that's kind of all part of our push for transparency in order to help our customers be transparent with their end customers. Um, I think a second best practice is, is understand where your data is. Right. So it's really impossible to secure your data if you don't know who has it and where it is. Um, and this doesn't have to be as scary as it sounds. You know, your DMS provider is, is, is a really great place to start. Um, for example, with, with, with us, you know, we, we have the ability, because everything is cloud based, to know where all of our dealers' data is currently located, uh, which third parties they've integrated with, and what data sets those third parties are receiving. Um, and we'll be kind of expanding this in the coming months to create a self-service portal where dealers can really quickly pull up all this information on their own. Um, and I also think this just generally ties in well with the privacy rights functionality we have, which allows dealers to really action privacy requests from customers, um, such as data deletion and, and, and do not share requests. Um, and then the third, I think, best practice uh, I, I would probably look at is data minimization. So collecting really only what you need and having a set retention policy. Um, and this really serves two purposes, right? So it, it makes it more likely that customers will provide you with the data you're asking for, um, while also reducing a dealer's compliance and security risk. Um, going back a bit to that T-Mobile breach I, I, we discussed earlier, um, part of what made this breach so egregious is that T-Mobile actually didn't have a data retention policy. Uh, what they did is they actually held data from customers that had left the carrier years ago uh, for no real reason, which just created unnecessary exposure for the companies when the hackers eventually got in. Um, so I, I would choose a DMS provider that really allows uh, dealers to set a retention period and automate it. Um, and then finally, like I mentioned, you know, data quality really matters more, more than quantity. So you don't need to know everything about your customers, but really focus on the data that's going to bring value to them. And once you have that data, you know, periodically check in with your customers to make sure that they're still interested in your service. Um, an example would be, you know, using your CR CRM uh, tool to see if your customers have even opened up your emails. And if they haven't in several months or a year, you know, ask them if they want to opt out. Um, this not only narrows your list of customers who are actually interested in your business, but it, it, it builds goodwill by kind of avoiding spamming those that, that, that might not be. So there's, there's obviously many more practices, but I think uh, those are probably the three that really come to my mind and what I would focus on as kind of easy first steps. Really good recommendation, Deepak. Let's jump into questions because I know we've received a few and they're addressed to all of the participants here. Mary Lou, um, do you wanna go into the questions and just navigating Q&A? Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you, everyone. First question to the Techion team. How is Techion responding to the FTC requirement being placed on dealers at the end of 2022? What changes will Techion be making to ensure their dealers' compliance? I think we'll let Deepak take that. Yeah, I can answer that one. Um, 
So one of the requirements of the safeguard rule uh, is that we need that as a dealer, you need to have multi-factor authentication turned on. Um, so within the Techion products, um, both on our side, so with our developers and our employees, we have multi-factor authentication in order to even get into our systems. Um, but then conversely on the customer side, you also have that turned on by default. So whenever your employees are logging into our products or logging into our systems, you, they have to go through this multi-factor uh, authentication. So that, that's kind of one way to, to take off the box. Um, separately, as I think some of our panelists have mentioned, uh, because the safeguard rules allows dealers to outsource some of these requirements to their vendors, you know, to the extent your data is connect, contained within our systems, we have a comprehensive security uh, program where we're constantly updating and addressing ever-changing threats and making sure that the data we are holding for you is remaining secure. And so that in turn kind of filters down to you as a dealer because that's helping you maintain the security over the data that we're, we're holding for you. So um, it, it's not so much that we are making any changes uh, to, to, to comply with the safeguard rules, but rather I think we're just, we're bringing it more to the attention of dealers of what already is in place under the Techion platform, which really addresses uh, some of these safeguard requirements. Thank you, Deepak. Um, one announcement I did want to make was that we do have a blog on our website about how Techion is helping dealers comply with GLBA. That might be a good starting point, and we're happy to address any questions offline. Um, but you know, to build on what Deepak was mentioning, I think one of the key requirements in the GLBA safeguards rule is to have a security program, um, which includes things like information security assessment, risk mitigation, vulnerability assessments, etc., all of which we do on an ongoing basis. And it is possible for us to amp that up as we go, just because we are on the cloud and it is obviously so much easier to do. Um, Next question, uh, this was a very interesting one. Uh, and I think we'll direct this to Vade. What is SOC certification and why should I care about it? <laughs> I'll talk about it and then I will let uh, Deepak uh, talk about it in more detail uh, because uh, this guy has uh, helped us uh, implement this in, uh, you know, very properly. Um, SOC you know, enforces certain controls to application providers. The application providers who are seeking SOC certification, they have to implement a lot of these controls, which make sure that we are handling data correctly. We are making sure that our employees are accessing the applications correctly. The overall access controls are placed so that, you know, if these controls are implemented in spirit and they are validated by before, you know, you get the SOC certification and you have to regularly get audited to get these certifications. What that means is if your application provider is SOC compliant, uh, you can, you know, believe that, you know, this proper security controls are in place, your data is secure, and, you know, most of the best practices that, you know, ensure the, you know, uh, security of your systems are in place in the application. Yeah, and I think I, just to build one other thing onto what Vade said, um, the advantage of a SOC certification is that it is audited by independent third party. So um, this is somebody else coming in who is qualified to assess these controls and to confirm that indeed this company has followed and implemented the controls that they say they do. Um, so it gives it gives the customer some assurance that uh, you know for a company like Techion, for example, is doing what it says it's doing. Absolutely. And um, as many of you who are our customers know, we are SOC 1 and 2 certified, and we have made those reports available to you, to many of you. Um, we will, over time, be making those reports available in the Techion Trust portal, uh, of course, with some authentication, etc. cetera. Uh, but again, transparency is the way to go on this. And our customers, we believe, have the right to know about the security measures and protocols that we follow. Um, 
another very interesting question that came in, and this goes back to a discussion I was having just yesterday with a customer. You touched on the subject of salespeople taking photos of customer driver's licenses and such, and I was called away and did not hear how the conversation ended. Can you review once again or send me the recording? This is a subject I'm trying to get control of for compliance purposes. I'll start and then maybe we can bring both Deepak and Aaron in because I'd love to hear their thoughts. Um, you know, I think uh, as long as activity happens within the Techion application, right? So if photos are taken within the Techion application, for example, we have a complete audit log of who has taken what, where that data has gone. Um, and so we are able to provide that complete log to you. The exposure for a dealer is when activity or those photos get taken outside of the Techion application, you know, for, for whatever reason, right? A dealer, you know, let's say is uh, somebody, a porter goes to deliver a vehicle to a customer at their home, just ends up taking a picture of the driver's license on his or her phone, right? And that's really where the exposure is. Um, and there's a couple different ways to address that. One is, of course, having kind of a bring your own device policy, which, um, you know, requires every employee who has his or her own device to subject themselves to monitoring. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's and there are applications um, that that do this, that monitor sort of what happens on that phone. And the second is obviously just issuing company phones to salespeople so that you minimize the risk of that happening. But I'd like to bring in Aaron and Deepak um, to see what their thoughts or perspectives are on this. Deepak, I'll, I'll go ahead um, uh, and, and join in. You know, this is a problem in, in the industry and it's because it's really a commission driven business, right? So salespeople uh, think of customers who are really technically the dealer's customers. They think of them as their own customers. And so salespeople keep customer lists. They consider themselves to have a book of repeat business, et cetera. They constantly call um, customers, et, et cetera. So the trick is getting to the salespeople uh, and, and perhaps some others in the organization who need to have consumer information to use the dealership's CRM software, to use the dealership's um, contact information system, whatever that, that may be, and, and, and then police that policy, whatever it is that you have in place. Um, and policing is a very difficult thing when you have people have their own phones uh, for use for these um, for these tasks, uh, that it, it's pretty hard to completely police. But if you either uh, make business phones available, which may be too expensive of a of a prospect for many dealers, um, or too impractical because it's hard to get salespeople to to do that, but that is one possibility. Another possibility would be to allow the downloading while someone is employed of your dealership CRM software to their phone uh, and have them use only that app. Another is to constantly hammer home the idea that the customers belong to the dealership. They do not belong to the employee and that everything has to be done as a team and through the team software, et cetera. There are ways to emphasize that without seeming like you're uh, you know, in the Gestapo all of a sudden. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely um, a hole in the game. It, it's something that is difficult to shore up. And I'm not sure there is an absolute perfect solution. Yeah, I, 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 I don't really have much to add to, to what Aaron just said, because, uh, you know, I, I, I the best practice is always if you can provide your own devices as a dealership that are secured and um, separate from your employees' personal devices, it's the best way to go. But obviously, cost is a consideration, and there's various other factors that come into play. Um, so it, it 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 is a challenge. Um, but it's it certainly going through. Uh, the, I, the one thing I would maybe add is maybe just training, right? So making sure that uh, periodically you are training these salespeople on some of these uh, 
thought processes and, and policies that you have, as Aaron mentioned, um, because it's it's one thing to tell somebody when they first come in, but reminding and repeating is, is always the best practice. And, and one thing that you just said, Deepak, that reminded me, a dealership needs to have a written policy about all of these things. Uh, it's, it's really impossible to prevent employees from using their own phones uh, uh, to do whatever it is they're going to do. But if you have a written policy and if you have training and if you're emphasizing how to handle this information, that will be the best shield you have against a leak that is caused by an employee doing that sort of thing. Absolutely, Aaron. I think in most cases, whether it's privacy or security, just raising the general awareness. So not just having a policy itself, but why you have the policy. What are you trying to protect against? What are the possibilities? What could go wrong? I think that goes a long way in sort of enabling compliance with that policy as well. Paul, a very interesting one for you. Um, can you comment on the general preparedness of the typical dealer to cope with the new tech and regulatory environment? Should we anticipate a flood of enforcement actions, fines, consent decrees, et cetera? Well, just a quick follow on to what was just said a moment ago. And when we're talking about, you know, just justifications and reasons for certain policies. Of course, one thing we always tell people about the safeguards rule, if it did not exist, if Gramlings Blali were never passed, Dealers would still have every risk management reason to go ahead and put steps in place to protect their customer information. There is liability if information is entrusted to them and there is a breach or there's some other problem. So a number of things that are in there, whereas we quarreled with certain elements of what the FTC had proposed, and we certainly were worried about what we thought was a lack of cost benefit analysis on their side. At the end of the day, dealers need to be proactive here whether or not there's a federal standard in place. It's in their own interest. It certainly protects their customers and everyone should unite around that goal. Uh, with regard to dealers' ability to comply with everything, really, we think it's exceedingly difficult. Uh, I, I think, you know, Mike obviously could talk firsthand about this with his own experience, but when you look at the federal regulations alone in all the different areas that are out there, and then again, you look at the state and in many cases, the local overlay, of requirements, and you consider just the structure of a dealership. I mean, when I've talked to finance sources before, a lot of times they'll have dozens, if not hundreds of attorneys that can help them come up with an appropriate compliance mechanism for whatever it is that they have to put in place. And of course, that is ideal. Dealers just simply don't have the overhead for that. If you look at the average dealership, which is about 62 employees, and you consider that most of those our service techs or their salespeople, when you really talk about the number that can do the type of things that everyone on this call is talking about, it is incredibly limited, which is why the outsourcing does become not only prudent, it really becomes of necessity unless you're talking about just a very large organization. So that is definitely the case. In terms of exposure to fines and other adverse consequences, I think it's much greater with the amended safeguards rule than it was previously for this reason. If you look at what the 2003 safeguards rule required, it really had five standards in there or five elements of a written program. You had to have a program coordinator to oversee it. You had to conduct a risk assessment. You had to come up with appropriate safeguards for the risk you had identified. You had to regularly audit them. You had to go ahead and oversee your service providers and you had to periodically adjust the program as necessary. Those are all still in place. Most of those, it's a real question as to whether or not you did what you had to do for your particular dealership. If you look at the new amended safeguards rule, they have a number of very explicit requirements and, and several of them we mentioned. You have to encrypt information both at rest and in transit. You have to have multi-factor authentication. You have to have penetration testing. There's a number of things you have to have in place. You have to have an incident response plan. And these are things that in some type of an enforcement investigation, somebody can take a look at and they can see right away whether or not they've been put in place. So the ability to identify a violation is probably much more clear cut now than it was previously. And it's not to suggest that there was no exposure before. Certainly there was. But when you have a lot of prescriptive, very defined requirements and you have limited enforcement staff with the FTC or any state agency, certainly something like that makes it a much easier 
um, it, it's much more easy to bring an enforcement action based on some type of a deficiency. So yes, we think the audit exposure is there. It is an area of concern. Dealers certainly have their hands full, and that's why it just has to be a full court press to do whatever they can to try to minimize the exposure. Thank you, Paul. Really good insights and observations. One follow-up question came up, which is, I think, very relevant to what we were just discussing. Um, I keep hearing everyone talking about the new compliance regulations, but where is the best place to obtain information pertaining to exactly what we are required and need to do? Maybe Paul and Aaron, both of you can take this one. Uh, sure. Uh, okay, certainly. So remember, the if we're talking about the FTC's proposed rule, let's keep in mind, although we have all kinds of concerns about it, we actually could talk about it for hours. I mean, it's, it's something we've really poured over. That is still a proposed regulation. So that's not something that dealers have to do today. As we know, proposals oftentimes will change in one way or another. So uh, what we do, though, is certainly uh, NADA houses um, on our webpage at NADA.org. We have a regulation section where we talk about the different rules and requirements we also have something called the federal regulatory maze. It's kind of in very simple terms, a sentence or two on each of the obligations, obviously not a deep dive, but it's more for awareness. And there's a number of other tools that are out there. Uh, the states have some great stuff. Many of the firms have put out some excellent stuff as well, but certainly at the federal level, that's how we list it. It's, it's on our website and it's something that it gets into the various areas, certainly the ones we've talked about, but also advertising and a number of other areas that affect dealers. Yeah, that's that's a great uh, recommendation. The NADA website has all of that information. Some of the state websites do. It's not as comprehensive about federal laws. They're more comprehensive about state laws. Uh, and then, of course, the FTC itself. One of the things that someone might fear, though, is that they didn't look at the right regulation or the right policy on one of these websites. And you probably should um, look yourself, but also talk to your counsel about uh, whether or not you've implemented the correct uh, uh, compliance measures for whatever the new policy might be that the FTC puts out. Thank you, Aaron. Um, one question that came in for Vaid. What is the major advantage of cloud-based systems and applications such as Techion versus localized systems? Do cloud-based systems make it easier to comply with the FTC safeguards rule? Of course, I think uh, we touched upon uh, some of the points here. Um, if you look at MFA, um, it's already there in solutions like Techion. If you talk about encrypting data at uh, rest as well as in motion, it's a it's a default thing. I mean, without having to you know follow any rules and guidelines, this this is a default thing that we have done in the past. Um, similarly, we have these tools. The platform allows you to tweak opt-in, opt-out preferences. Um, we already built it uh, as part of uh, customizations across states and countries. So those are customizations because uh, you know uh, the modern day solutions like Techion are more on the side of platform. They platformize everything. So it becomes very easy to you know, roll out any further customizations that are needed to comply with any new changes that are coming to regulations. Versus if you talk about uh, traditional software, so many of these things might be missing. And if it's locally deployed, you get into you know, uh, data security and, you know, yourself. You have to actually validate a lot of things, get some pen tests done. Those things you may have to take care of. Um, on the premise, and it, it just takes away, you know, all of those complications when you are, you know, utilizing uh, one of the solutions that are on the cloud. And and so, Ved, would you say to sum it up that in the in a cloud solution, many of these things are incorporated by design, um, and sort of are to be expected, as opposed to if you took more traditional systems, uh, that this is something that maybe would create more of an onus on the, the dealer to put in place formal policies. Yes, that's correct. Actually, most of the cloud solutions have these things thought you know, from the beginning itself. And uh, Techion itself has been uh, very serious about security, even from the beginning and from the early stages itself. So our overall, uh, implementation is already following those things and that's why we have 
many of these things that are going to come already implemented and available to the consumers. Sounds great. Mike, one question for you. Overall, do you think the industry is moving towards a less profitable future? How do we absorb the cost of keeping up with new regulations and compliance obligations and still sell cars and service? Yeah, that's a great question. We've been blessed with you know, a business model that's been um, very efficient over the last few years. You know, one of our biggest costs is, is inventory, right? And, and we just haven't had any because uh, demand has exceeded supply. You know, a lot of these regulatory requirements going forward are going to cost money. Um, uh, every retailer is going to have to invest and invest prudently to ensure that they, you know, comply. And uh, so that just adds cost to the overall regulatory requirement, um, if you will. Um, so yeah, I think I think uh, we got it. You know, the cost of capital is going up, you know, probably another 75 basis points tomorrow and more to come, it looks like, in this inflationary environment. And average transaction prices are at, at an all-time high. So, you know, affordability is going to be tough going forward for certain products. And, uh, yeah, I, th I think we, we all are in for a more competitive uh, landscape um, with more uh, regulatory costs to ensure that we comply with the law. And uh, um, so, you know, I, I think we all have to become more efficient. We all have to work at finding ways to um, become leaner and, uh, with, and, and reduce costs somehow. Technology I, can help with that. Yeah, so. Absolutely. And I think that's true of, of most industries as well, like as we head into um, these uncertain times, let's just put it that way. Um, thank you, everyone. I think that was really the end of the Q&A. Uh, over to our panelists for any concluding thoughts or observations before we wrap. Maybe we'll just do a quick round robin. Uh, Mike, uh, Paul, they Deepak, and then Aaron. I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate. It's a very, very relevant uh, topic. And I think all dealers need to be aware um, of, you know, the regulatory environment in which we live and to ensure that, you know, our, our industry um, is ready and, uh, and, and, and is aware of, of what's forthcoming. So thanks to Techion for, for pulling this together and it was a pleasure to serve with all. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, Paul, over to you. Well, I'm probably stating the obvious, particularly after some of the great observations from the other panelists, but with regard to safeguards rule compliance, uh, hopefully dealers really appreciate the need to get on this today if they've not already. You know, a lot of new federal regulatory requirements, they all involve a lift, even if it's something that seems basic. You have to train, you have to build into your systems. Oftentimes there's a retention obligation, but a lot of those you can do in a relatively short period of time. This is really a massive undertaking. When you consider where many dealers are uh, pre the announcement of this rule to where they need to be December 9th, there are a number of things that have to be put in place. It extends to what they do in-house. It extends to service providers. It extends to really any aspect of the rule. So it's going to require a lot of time and getting on it today, working with their vendors, with their professionals is absolutely key. Thank you. Aaron, um, over to you. I would just remind people that the FTC can't go after every violation that happens in the United States. It's a big country. They're a, an agency that governs all industry, not just our industry. And so what they do is they try and choose their targets wisely in order to set an example on any particular enforcement paradigm that they have going on. So it's important for dealers to keep on top of their compliance as best as possible. So they're not the example. <laughs> <laughs> wow, no pressure. Okay. <laughs> Ved and then Deepak. Sorry, Ved, you're on mute. Yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, the technology has advanced a lot. And, uh, you know, these compliances might give a headache to a lot of our you know customers um 
but you know it's it's going to be easier because technology providers uh, have been on top of this and it, you know because of the kind of technologies that have come um it's going to be an easy journey it's not going to be that difficult I can certainly say for, for myself that as I was preparing for this session, um, I have now become much more conscious about the cookie settings that I enable, uh, you know, when I just browse on the internet or who I share my data with. I never thought I would get to that day, but after seeing what can happen, it's something that I'm certainly more conscious about. And I think Deepak is extremely happy to hear that. So let's <laughs> over to Deepak and then we'll conclude. Yeah, I, I would. Uh, yeah, I, I would just add. I think first off, this is a really great insight with from everybody. So I'm really, really excited to have been part of this panel. Um, I would just say, you know, there's lots of changes coming, but there is hope. And I think for from a dealer perspective, uh, this can also be somewhat of an advantage, right? Because it, it, if you can get these compliance things down, um, and you can nail out down some of the the high risk areas of your business it really does give you a competitive advantage ultimately, right? Because then you are able to use data in a way that's meaningful for your business. And so as one way to maybe even flip this around is think of this as an investment in your future, right? Because these regulations aren't going away. So what can you do to, 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 to best future-proof your business? And I, I think that's maybe one way that uh, can set a dealer apart from, from, from their competitors. So, um, Maybe a silver lining if, if if one can be taken out of this. Absolutely. And I think, you know, just providing a customer perspective, I mean, sometimes I just dread walking into any retailer, just knowing that they're going to have my information and I'm going to be spammed with a bunch of promotional offers, none of which I want. Right. So I think, um, you know, when dealerships are more mindful about what they reach out to customers for and who they reach out to, I think that enables a better customer experience. With that, I think we will conclude today. We've received a lot of questions about whether there will be a recording available. Mary Lou, I will let you respond to that, but I know we are recording this session and we plan to share it with everybody who registered, right? Yes, that is correct. We will send everyone an email once the on-demand recording is available on the web. Okay, sounds great. With that, I think we're right on time. So we will conclude. Thank you so much, Mike, Paul, Aaron, Ved, and Deepak for doing this with us. And thank you to all our attendees who took the time out of their day to attend this session. Thank you so much.